I'm Gillian Parker. I'm on the Policy and Insights team for Economist Impact here in Singapore. Welcome to the panel today, Where's Your Head At? Mental Illness as the Great Unspoken uh, Epidemic at our t of Our Time. And I'm joined today by Janice Wenkui Jin, uh, Senior Assistant Director at the MOH Office for Healthcare Transformation in Singapore. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Berla, uh, founder and chairperson of Empower Initiative, um, Adita uh, Berla Education Trust. Welcome, thank you so much for joining us. Anthea Ong, former nominated member of Parliament of Singapore and founder and chairperson of WorkWell Leaders. Thank you so much for joining us. And joining us virtually today is Jian Long, director of the Office of Cooperation and Collaboration at Shanghai Mental Health Center, Shanghai Chao Zhong. Tong University School of Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today. You'll find a full biography of our speakers on the screen under the media player and in the event um, collateral for in-person audience. Please, um, I, invite the, I invite the virtual audience to um, send in your questions for our panel today. More than 700,000 people lose their life to suicide every year and the world is likely to miss a 2030 target of reducing suicide by one-third. In 2005 and later in 2012, the World Health Organization adopted resolutions promoting a comprehensive, coordinated response to mental health um, from the health and the social sector, um, sectors of member states. So there is a revolution in treatment of mental health is long overdue. Um, in, a, in a report released uh, by the WHO last year, um, in the first year of COVID, the prevalence of anxiety and depression increased by 25% worldwide. And disorders of the brain are also a growing worry. This panel seeks to explore how this silent epidemic can be brought to the fore and the solutions that can reduce the stigma and foster treatment. Um, plenty to talk about today. Um, perhaps, I mean, uh, the question um, that will probably be featured in most of the panels today is really how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the life of patients with mental health issues. And where has the pandemic made the need for policy development and prioritization more urgent, uh, Janice? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. I think the work that I do in the Ministry of Health, uh, Office for Healthcare Transformation, is really looking at prevention and uh, early detection of like, uh, people with like, risk symptoms. Uh, and one of the things that we do is to look at digital solutions to address uh, mental health needs of the population. So one of the things that we did uh, as a result of the pandemic was to develop a digital solution called MindLine. Uh, and I think a large part of why we started uh, this journey is because of the stresses that we were seeing at the community level. So we have like increase in like domestic abuse that we were seeing in the families because Singapore is our, you know, we have very small flats, right? So during the lockdown period, people were stuck at home. So like families were like seeing like increases in like quarrels or like um, existing families with like dysfunctional structure, then they found it hard to like live together in a small unit. So I think that's one thing as well. The other one was like caregiver stress. Uh, so you know during the pandemic situation, like families were kind of all at home, right? Like so you have the mothers who had to work as well as care for their kids at the same time. So it was very hard for them. So the stresses associated with some of the social issues mm. kind of emerged very strongly during the pandemic situation. And I think this is exacerbated for like patients with mental illness, right? So one of the things that was interesting, I think, is the access to face-to-face -face services became an issue mm. as a result of the pandemic situation. Uh, it was not easy to get an appointment to see your psychologist or to go to the hospital. So, um, I mean, I think there was a period of time then the government really stood, stood in and see what are some of the digital solutions. So telehealth, teleconferencing became one of the means of getting uh, access to services for patients with mental illness. But that is not easy, as you can imagine, right? So not everyone is tech savvy, not er everyone is comfortable with uh, digital means of accessing services. So I think this were some of the issues that uh, kind of emerged but as well as the innovation that came along during the pandemic situation. Mm, 
Anthea, I mean, I mean, particularly in the, the world of work, um, you know, mental health became a big issue. I mean, particularly, uh, we've just issued some um, research on this uh, and running a survey. I mean, the role of the, the, the manager in looking after their team, that's a huge amount of stress, um, even in the, within the workplace, you know, and that well-being. How did the, the pandemic really sort of make that more urgent? Oh, um, hugely, Gillian. I think, um, interestingly, I think the pandemic has been a silver lining um, in terms of illuminating, you know, um, the issue of mental health uh, with leaders and CEOs and employers. Um, I think to Janice's point, uh, mental health, is, it's always been there, right? It's not a new problem. It's just been uh, made a bigger problem by the pandemic um, and more so at the workplace. We in Asia, um, particularly in Singapore, um, we've always had um, challenges in terms of uh, burnout, you know, amongst workers. And Singapore also holds um, one of the top places <laughs> when it comes to, you know, uh, being one of the most burnout uh, amongst its worker population. Um, but we often, which, which I think it's, 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 it's important, um, and a lot of work that we're doing now is to focus on how to support worker mental health and well-being um, at the workplace. But what we really need to um, also, you know, um, put our attention on alongside this focus on employee well-being is also on the well-being, as, as you said, uh, Gillian, on managers and leaders. Um, CEOs especially. The C-suite really determines the culture of a workplace. Um, CEOs set the, sto the, the tone um, of the organization. So, you know, so at Well Leaders and a, a, a charity now, um, we just got our charity status on Monday, um, you know, has been a collective of CEOs and C-suite leaders since May 2018. So this was even pre-pandemic. Um, getting CEOs and leaders to look at employee well-being, not just as a HR responsibility and leaving it as an afterthought, um, but looking at it more as a leadership priority. Um, and, and integrating that into the culture because we're not going to go away. Work has fundamentally changed because of pandemic. The future of work is really looking to be one of hybrid. Um, so many of the social connections that we used to have at the workplace is going to be gone. Um, you know, with the mounting challenges of inflationary pressures and supply chain disruptions, um, you know, we can't think of coming out of the pandemic and thinking, therefore, mental health is not going to be an issue. In fact, it will always be an issue if we're dealing with human beings. So I think, um, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of bittersweet, right? Um, it's taken us so many decades to try to push this in the workplace, Gillian, uh, but the pandemic did it within a year. Um, and we saw that actually in the collective. Um, I start, when I started this, it was only 20 other CEOs I could convince to come on board, um, and then at the, at the height of the pandemic, we had 135 of them, yeah. I mean, we did see during the pandemic, um, CEOs coming out of large firms, international firms, and, and speaking quite openly about some of the mental health struggles. I mean, um, that must be some of the messaging that surely must resonate throughout our company. Yeah. Um, Dr. Perla, uh, where have you seen uh, this, the, has this, the pandemic accelerated the policy development or is this gonna come from the private sector, this emphasis on mental health? So I think it'll have to be a combination of the two because uh, I don't think the private sector alone can uh, you know, be a game changer. So it'll have to be a collaboration between the government and uh, the private sector. So pretty much like what we do is that we are uh, in rural in, in the rural state where we are, we work with the government and their district mental health policy, uh, and that's the only way to push it. Uh, because I mean, like we all know, and, and I think adding to what both of you said it was pretty much the same in India, where the concerns, uh, you know, were really really came into sharper focus thanks to the pandemic, which therefore really worked out to be a good silver lining. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to add to what you said, pre-pandemic when we started Empower. Uh, the awareness was very dismal. It was very disheartening. Uh, our first press conference we had about two two journalists attended, uh, and and you know people in the corporate sector were just not willing to talk about it. And during the pandemic, we saw a sudden surge of 
corporates who are wanting to talk about it and do things for their employees. And so, and now where we are, where of course people are really talking about it and the government also is trying to bring about new policies and innovation and, um, you know, get a helpline going, which is going to be nationwide. So the government is also trying, uh, but it has to be a partnership between the two to really be a true game changer and to make things happen. Thank you. Um, uh, Jiang Long, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the WHO has urged governments to use the social determinants of health approach to address uh, mental health, inviting a closer look at uh, the inequities that exist. So how does this help us identify uh, where the problem of mental illness and suicide is most acute? Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here today. So I, I, I'm a psychiatrist. So my, my perspective is more like uh, from a perspective of a, a practitioner. So, so yes, I, I think what I was, I was thinking, you know, from, from as a psychiatrist, I was thinking that what should we do? I mean, because of that pandemic, my colleagues already mentioned it because uh, what uh, Shanghai, where my my hospital locates, actually had a massive uh, outbreak this earlier this this year. So what we have observed is that uh, the pandemic actually caused a lot of different, you know, more mental health issues uh, in different populations, and also restricted access to to mental health care in the in the populations and also uh, my hospital also experienced very limited like uh, mental health care resources because a lot of resources goes to anti-infection departments and for i mean after we are we are I hopefully we are at the end of this pandemic. So, so I I was wondering that after this pandemic, what we we can do better to I identify uh, mental health mental health issues. But as a psychiatrist, I think what we need to do is that uh, we now professionally we have a new tool for diagnosis. Uh, for mental health issues, we have now uh, the WHO has uh, issued ICD-11, which is a new uh, medical classifications for mental for 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 all diseases, including mental health dis diseases. So this is this is actually what we are doing at our center. So our center is also a WHO collaborating center in uh, for research and. Uh, for, for research and uh, training in mental health. So what we, we did is that we are conducting uh, professional trainings on ICD-11 to help us to identify uh, mental disorders more accurately and more, 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 more properly. Mm. That's what we did. And also, I mean, from, from another uh, level, I mean, uh, ministry, level, I think what we need to do is that we need to scale up national and sub as well as sub national mental health care. And also what we need to do is that uh, in our society, we need to promote uh, he more health literacy uh, on mental health. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, where particularly we've been uh, in looking at different health systems across the world, um, you know, they're, they're cash strapped. Where, how then can we um, identify and um, the problem of mental illness and, and um, identify the areas that are most acute, Anthea? Where the mental health illness, um, the most acute? Yeah, how do we go about identifying that issue uh, the most efficiently um, and uh, w what can help us identify where the need is greatest in, in mm. vast scale of mental health? Yeah, okay, um, I got you. So I think, I think to your point earlier when you talked about WHO, um, you know, encouraging governments to use the social determinants of health approach, that really is to say that we should look at mental health as a population health issue. 
mm. right? Um, and, and therefore, it's really, well, there's two parts to that. One is, if it's a population health issue, then we need to also think about um, uh, mental health inequity or equity um, areas. But, but more importantly, to also look at mental health as a continuum. Um, and I think, I think that's really important because we have, even in Singapore, but across the world, I think until the pandemic um, hit us, uh, many of the narratives around mental health has, have always been more downstream, right? more curative, um, more providing services to those who are already affected um, with mental health conditions. But I think when you talked about it being a population health issue um, and, and using social determinants of the health approach, then, then you need to sort of take a step back and go upstream and more preventive. So I think as a society, um, you know, as, at least from the policy perspective and identifying where mental health um, could be prevented, um, that would be you know, one of the most important things that we need to do learning from what we have come from the pandemic, and that is really across the, the entire population, um, through schools, workplaces, communities. Um, you then need to look into the different segmentation. Um, in Singapore, in particular, uh, we are really concerned about two ends of our population, right? Um, the youth especially, so we've had um, you know, an increase, and that's been an upward trend in terms of youth suicide. Um, and, and we all know this from studies that the onset of mental illness can come in as early as eight years old, and Jiang Long will uh, support me on the clinical aspect of it. Uh, and so then we need to really go as far back as in school, right, to, to introduce mental health education, and that was definitely something I pushed for um, in Parliament to make sure mental health education is compulsory in, in all schools. Uh, and that's happening in Singapore from this year onwards. Yeah. Um, and I think also, um, you know, the elderly um, population um, in Asia, well, especially in Singapore with the rapidly aging population, that's definitely also coming to play as where we need to put a lot of efforts. Mm -hmm. Uh, at least in terms of the policy um, resources. But I, 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 if I may, just one last bit is to say that I think because we're looking at it as a whole of society effort, um, therefore we can't look at mental health as a health issue, right? It needs to also be looked at as a social issue. And so um, going back to what you say about what policy development and how do we identify um, where are the risk areas, right, where mental health is concerned, we really need to start, I think, as governments also, um, which I'm hoping to see here, uh, for different ministries to also come together to do a whole-of-government approach. Mm -hmm. And then we will have a whole-of-society um, outcome, I think, where mental health is concerned. Um, but I really think it's important not to just focus on identifying people only when they are already ill, mm. right? That's important, don't get me wrong, but we know stigma is so entrenched. The treatment gaps are still so long um, that we really can't just be focusing um, the mental health narrative on just those who are already ill. We need to look at the entire continuum. Yeah, if I could add on yes, to it, like I definitely agree with the need to look more upstream mm. uh, to focus on prevention and mm. promotion, right? So I think Jiang Long brought up the point of like education and like mental health literacy. I think that's the first step to then reducing the treatment gap, right? Yeah. So people need to be aware what are some of the signs and symptoms. Mm. They need to be aware where are the touch points and resources and support in the community. And if they would step forward to seek help earlier. I think a lot of the downstream costs, economic costs could be reduced over time. And I think one of the aspects that I would like to share is, I think oftentimes we think about mental health as a standalone, physical health as something else, spiritual health as something else, right? And social health, right? Mm. So I think one thing that uh, really we need to start to rethink is holistic well-being, right? Yeah. How do we think about physical health, mental health, social health? 
as one and how do we then approach it from a holistic well-being perspective rather than thinking about mental health as something standalone and things like comorbidities, right? So we know that when someone has a chronic illness, mm -hmm. oftentimes there's a bi-directional factor yep. to mental health, right? How it impacts on mental health and how poor mental health then affects on recovery. Yeah. So how can then we address this need uh, from a very holistic perspective? I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I have to say just, um, I mean, just recently, I, I've been living here for about three years, I have seen more public communication around mental health. Um, I mean, where I'm from actually is extremely conservative in terms of the mental approach to mental health, but yet the suicide rates are probably the highest in the UK. Where are you from, Gillian? I'm from Northern Ireland. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, is that part of the part of the problem here, at Dr. Verla? You know, getting over that stigma, just really communicating and making that communication mainstream. Absolutely. I think one of the biggest uh, reasons why mental health. Uh, is just not spoken about is because of the stigma attached mm -hmm. to it. It's just, at least back home in India, and uh, what I'm gathering from you all is, is very similar, where uh, it's a cultural, social issue. You know, culturally, we are just not used to accepting mental health as something that we need to treat. It's always seen pers as a personal failing. If, you're, if you have a mental health issue, normally people think that because you are incapable of handling a situation, therefore you've landed yourself with a mental health concern. And most often people don't like to acknowledge that. Yeah. So I think, and therefore that adds to the stigma because culturally one believes that mental health is something that is not spoken about. Uh, you know, people often discriminate against people who have a mental health concern. They always think that they're just not good enough. Uh, as a result of which, then people don't want to seek help because they don't want to acknowledge that there is a mental health concern. Mm. So I think if we are able to break that stigma down, if we're able to stamp out that stigma, which can only come with creating more awareness, and that awareness, A, needs to start, I believe, start, needs to start with our own selves because we all are, are we're a microcosm of the entire universe, of the entire society. Mm. So if we start with it ourselves, that yes, we need to acknowledge there's a mental health concern, and then in our own little ecosystems, so whether it's in, in the corporate world where, you know, good HR systems need to put emotional well-being and mental health well-being into practice, where it is spoken about, where it is not, you know, it's not judged upon, it's non-judgmental, or whether in schools where it becomes more preventive, where we can actually start a mental health curriculum in schools. Mm -hmm. Because if you get them young, then you're also teaching them the right coping mechanisms and you're also teaching them that, you know, it's not something to be uh, stigmatized. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so like that, if we are able to create that the uh, a, a, a safe haven for people in our own little ecosystems, in our workplaces, I think that's how we'll be able to create a ripple effect and really uh, at a larger level, at a macro level, then be able to stamp out the stigma. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I just add on um, something else? I think... Uh, Niger is absolutely right. In fact, many studies across um, Asia and uh, across the world, um, a, main, a main reason for not seeking help is stigma and discrimination. Yeah. Right? And in Singapore, that's actually been um, validated by the National Mental Health Study. Mm. Um, and stigma, and I like what Niger just said, right? Um, because it really has to come from ourselves because there are actually three levels of stigma. Mm. When we talk about mental health stigma, there are three levels. Um, we know, all know about social stigma, and social stigma, you know, to your point, Gillian, if there's more um, public communications around it, when we mainstream it, then social stigma would reduce, and social stigma really means that we do not therefore label someone who has a mental health condition mm -hmm. as, as you said, uh, less capable, lack of willpower, all of this was some of the public attitudes that came out in a survey that we did. Um, but the two other levels of stigma are, are more insidious and harder to uh, remove, actually. Um, one is self-stigma, mm -hmm. as you said, right? And I personally went through that myself. I also have my own personal brush with depression 16 years ago. Um, and so as much as I am empathetic and compassionate with others when they have challenges, when I myself um, collapsed right, with um, that depression, I, I was really just filled with so much shame and despair, right? And it was so hard, you know, to get beyond that. It's easier to take care of someone else, but when it happens to you, it's hard for you to be able to sort of accept that. So the self-stigma is really um, 
you know, it's, it's really something we must be aware of. Um, the third level is structural stigma or institutional stigma. So that really comes from policies, whether at workplaces, um, at the governmental le level or in schools. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and any stigma really needs to be something that we um, need to really just not let go of, um, even if the pandemic seems to be abating. Yeah. Um, because really, there is no health without mental health. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Jian Long, I would love to get your point of view on high stigma then uh, and this issue of uh, discrimination, whether it's self and structural. Um, how does that complicate then the treatment uh, as a health practitioner? Yeah, stigma. I mean, mental health used to be a big taboo in many countries, especially I think in Asian countries. So. So stigma, when, when stigma comes in, it's, it really can, you know, bring a lot of negative consequences in our treatments. Because for one, the patients would, uh, will be reluctant to come to our, our outpatient services, or not mention inpatient services. They, they, they would never go to inpatient services because the uh, stigma, stigma is one thing, then consequences is another thing. So think about it. If a person has been diagnosed with mental illnesses, and how how are they gonna work? I mean, it's gonna be very you know tricky for them to go back to their workplaces. Then workplace uh, mental health at workplace is another thing we need to think about. So so it's uh, what I'm trying to say here is that stigma in uh, for. Uh, in mental uh, disorders, it's very complicated. It's not we we need collective efforts to to against it. But I mean, there is no easy solution. We need to, for one thing, I mean, uh, from a perspective of of a clinical pro professional, I think for one thing, what we need to do is that we need to again, it's education mm -hmm. on mental health. That's one thing we need to do. Another thing is that we need to, uh, at different uh, places, for example, as our colleagues already mentioned it, at school, at workplaces, and uh, uh, our medical facilities, and uh, I mean, it, it, promotions needs, needs to be done in, uh, in these uh, in this, uh, different places. And also, I think, uh, the health authorities needs to, you know, take the lead and to to promote mental health literacy. And I think uh, by doing this, we we might to, you know, to to uh, to to get the this stigma less and less in our society. And uh, and uh, by doing this, it can also promote our treatment. And also, I think uh, pr for pre prevention. I think it's also very good. Mm, thank you. Just staying with you there. Um, I mean, we saw, uh, we have seen some pretty, um, in the headlines, you know, issues around youth and adolescence, um, uh, you know, particularly in the, maybe the celebrity sphere, but I'm sure it's a, a wider phenomenon. Um, what are some of the stresses and challenges um, faced by youths and adolescents? Um, which, which is, seems to be increasing, an increasing trend, where there's an increasing trend of youth suicide rates. Suicide, suicide is uh, really, you know, like very tricky. I think because I worked a little bit at our National Health Commission of China, so in Beijing. So I, I, I'm aware of that uh, su uh, suicide among among minors uh, is really a big, you know, issue in China. I think that we, we, we need a national strategy for suicide prevention. That's one thing for sure. And I think uh, a lot of countries, I, 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 I'm aware that uh, Singapore, they, they, they are doing this quite, uh, quite uh, good. But uh, I mean, a lot of countries in Asia, we, we don't have national strategies for suicide prevention. And that's what we need to work on. And also, I think it's capacity buildings for, for mental health professionals. I think that, especially for, for suicide, how can we deal with those situations? And we need to, you know, to enhance our 
cap capacity buildings in this area. I think those those two things we we need to do at least in China. But I'm I'm very curious curious for 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 I mean for to to hear about uh, what what's going on in Singapore and in India and other countries. Mm. Yeah, if anyone else would like to add to that, particularly on the on the youth and on uh, suicide and, and minors. Yeah. Mm. I, I could add on a little to this. Mm. So um, we recently did like a six month long user research uh, with young people in Singapore. Mm. So we interviewed uh, many young people from the age of like 17 to 25 to understand some of the stresses that they face in the Singapore system. So I think some of it is not uh, unique, right? Exam stress, uh, high expectations. Yeah. So one of the things that Singapore is famous for is like our academic achievements and the productivity aspect uh, of our country, right? So such things are good, uh, but on the reverse side, then there's a lot of pressure on young people to perform well in school and in life. I think that's one part of a key stressor for a young person in Singapore. But some of the insights that we gained that were a bit more interesting were the, the miscommunication or the inability to communicate about their mental health issues and the emotional challenges to their parents and to their teachers and to trusted adults like counsellors, right? Mm. So one of the things they said, uh, one of the interesting quotes we had was, choosing the right counsellor is like choosing the right hairdresser for yourself you got to go around to different hairdressers to find out which is the most suitable for you, right? Totally. So in the same way for a young person, so they're used to things like Tinder, they're used to things like Facebook, where they have choice, you know, like our trip advisor, right? You have the choice of the hotel, right? So in the same way, I think navigating the right support system for a young person is very, very difficult. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it doesn't help that there's stigma, right? So they, they perceive it, Sometimes in real terms, it might have an impact on their career. It might have an impact on their um, education journey, right? If you have a mental illness, you might not be able to be accepted to be a medical school or to be a nurse. And some of these uh, considerations are real and we have to kind of acknowledge it and see how we can support our young people in having the courage to seek help. But after they do have the courage to seek help, then how do we address some of the real issues that exist mm. from a policy level, I think. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There's also a lot of effort that's now being placed on um, supporting the parents, yeah. right? Um, if we think about young people, then, um, you know, we talked about culture and how culture um, is not really just within the workplace or within the community, but also within the family. Right, so the parenting capacity and being able to support um, our children um, who are facing, you know, very different world to what we think, you know, we know when we were young. Because this, this whole idea of, you know, um, living within the social media, um, it's not what, you know, um, parents of young people today, which really I would include myself in terms of the age group, right, uh, would know. We, we, don't, we don't understand that. Um, so I think that's also, you know, a real need. And that's a great le level of change, I think, to focus on the parents because we could do a lot uh, in schools um, and even, you know, uh, with the peer support training because young people tend to share a lot more of their emotional challenges with their peers and friends. Um, and so we're doing all of that in Singapore. Um, to Jiang Long's point, who wants to know what we're doing here. But I think we're coming to the last frontier. And that frontier is that they can get all of this, but when they go home, mm. how are they being seen and supported by their parents? And it's not no parent want you know, anything but the best for their children but it's also coming from um, a new level of skills that parents need to have mm. to support um, the youth of today. Mm. And so I think that's, that's where we are really trying to focus more on now with a lot of the national programs. Uh, I just came from a national committee um, on a tripartite oversight committee on um, workplace safety and health. And even that, we were talking about how do we support parents who are within the working population. Right. Mm. Right, because, because um, if you think about it, the working population actually straddle as the, care, the parents of the young and the caregivers of the old. Mm. 
And these two segments, the ones that we're seeing in most countries and definitely in Singapore as having the highest prevalence of mental health mm. challenges. Mm. And so we can actually you know, um, use the workplace structures to get to equip um, parents and caregivers, I think then we have a good shot. I mean, you sort of touched on, just to take a question there from the audience about the gaps that you see today and, and who plays a role in closing these gaps and perhaps parents do play a role. I mean, I've got two children. Then. Mm. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's quite a lot of responsibility on parents. Who else is um, responsible in helping to close the gaps that exist? I think another, uh, to add to the parents, uh, which is, of course, very important, uh, but I think it's also very important to equip the teachers yeah. because the children are constantly in touch with teachers and very yeah. often we see that the teachers really don't know how to deal with mental health concerns and they, and they more often are the first point of contact, right? Uh, but they don't know how to deal with it. So if we can equip them and give them some mental health literacy mm -hmm. to really, uh, you know, exp to kind of equip them with tools so that they do become the first point of contact. Uh, so not only to instantly help the children, but also to then identify certain red flags and know which are the children which need the extra care. And then they can uh, you know, put them forward to a counselor. So even if they can become the first point of contact, if, they can just, if they're even, to, even able to just identify the red flags in the children, and then put them forward for further treatment. So therefore, it becomes very important, uh, I think, if we work if all stakeholders come together, which is the children, the parents, as well as the teachers, I think that kind of a combination and that kind of collaborative work will become very important. Mm. So even if the children express themselves, but if the teachers don't know how to handle it, um, you know, they're just sort of, uh, sort of pushed under the carpet. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and then even if a child is genuinely not able to do well at school because he's got a, he or she has a genuine mental health concern, more often than not, the teachers just pushing the child and just labeling the child as being lazy or not dedicated enough or, you know, and so on and so forth. So that also is a very important uh, aspect. And then if we, are, if we are able to actually have a mental health curriculum in schools, and if the teachers are the ones who have to deliver it, uh, you know, increasing their mental health literacy also becomes very important. Mm. Um. I mean, how do uh, I think one of the one of the things you find in Economist Impact's own research in this area is um, in terms of trying to really emphasise this importance of well-being in the workplace. You have to almost draw a link to the bottom line of businesses. We've talked about success in Singapore and everyone pushing themselves extremely hard. How might then you know the deterioration of mental health affect economic growth and the, the quality of human capital, and which you know also reaches into sort of talent retention and so on? Mm, um, actually, at every level, yeah. I, I think it is um, you know mental health really is an essential threat um, to all economies and societies. Um, you know, especially increasingly as we talked about um, a knowledge economy, right? Um, we are all doing cognitive work um, these days, and Singapore is especially uh, dependent on that um, for our economic growth. So I really don't see um, that we can actually get away from addressing this as a strategic issue as a country, as an existential um, threat, you know, to our sustainable growth, um, and, and which is why I have been pushing that we really need a permanent mental health office uh, that then helps to coordinate um, across, you know, not just across all the ministries, uh, which obviously that, that is going to be helpful, but then it then allows us to have a new narrative that we can't talk about human capital being the most important asset um, and not focus on the human, but only focus on the capital, mm. right? So, and workplaces too, we always talk about human resources, but in a way we've been looking at HR policies, if you think about it, it's really more about focusing on the resources of the human resources, but not really the human. And if we want to talk about human as what Janice um, you know, earlier alluded to, then we need to look at each worker, each member of society, each child, each you know, each healthcare worker as a whole person, 
Uh, and that's hard, right? That's, that's being human-centered, but that calls for a shift of um, you know, the narrative that then fits into the policy development, that then goes into workplace policies, into education curriculum and system, the way teachers are trained, the way you know, workers are trained. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really don't... I think we will hit a point, Gillian. Uh, we are already. Last year, there was a nationality, nationally represented representative study that shows one in nine Singaporeans reporting an adverse decline in their mental health. Mm -hmm. right? And that's almost all of the population saying that they are actually affected. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's obviously not going to be good for us. Yeah. Um, and it's a world over. I don't think it's yeah. actually unique to Singapore, yeah, um, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm going to ask our poll question. Is Asia ready for the application of psychedelics to mental health treatment? Goodness, that sounds like a terrible idea, but I'd love to know what you think. Uh, please wave yes or no. Wave it side to side if you're not quite sure. Uh, we've got a little bit of a mix, and we'll get our online response to that as well. Our panel, perhaps undecided. Would anyone like, like to weigh in on that? It's quite a clinical question. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be undecided for now, I think. Um, well, you know, what are the, we saw the huge advancement of uh, digital mental health, especially during the pandemic. Mm. Um, you know, what are some of the uh, are we seeing similar advancements in mental health treatment in, in that space? Mm, I think uh, digital, the use of digital tools and technology definitely saw an uprise. Uh, I think it's one of the silver lining that we saw during the pandemic yeah. situation. Uh, I think, you know, in the past, it's not that it was not researched or looked upon into, but I think the pushback was pretty high. Uh, having face-to-face -face counseling sessions, face-to-face -face treatment, I, I think that was the norm. Uh, and I think Jiang Ong can probably attest to it. Uh, the barriers to, like, doing telehealth, teleconferencing were pretty high. But I think one of the things that happened during the pandemic situation is it was almost forced upon the population to explore the use of digital tools and technology to access support and services. So I think therapy games, uh, you know, interesting web applications, I think even treatment, if you talk about the use of like psychedelics and like, I mean, things like this, this was really the push towards uh, giving access at a scalable level, right? I think scalability is the key part of it. Long-term cost is definitely one of the key issues that I think all nations worry about. So I think technology is really one key way that we could kind of contain costs, but provide services to a larger population size. Jian mm. Long, uh, perhaps you could weigh in on that. Um, some of the innovations that could perhaps accelerate the treatment, better treatment of mental health. Yeah, yeah, sure. So telemedicine is really, I mean, it's a, it's a hot topic in, in mental health. And I think personally, I think it really helps. So during the massive outbreak earlier this week, uh, this year in Shanghai, I mean, we applied it a lot of, you know, changes and uh, adjustments. So, so we basically, we, we, we used our telemedicine systems to, to help people who cannot come to our, our hospital in person, and it really helped. So telemedicine is uh, surely, I mean, the, uh, telemedicine can really help to help us to provide treatment uh, uh, consultations to, to, to people in need. And another trend is that uh, in Shanghai, we, we, we are doing a lot of like, uh, we call it smart, smart care. So we use like uh, uh, a lot of AR or, or, you know, machine learning and other, you know, other very advanced technologies to help us to provide uh, better treatment, better interventions to to people in need people with uh, mental disorders mm -hmm. i think that in 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 the us i mean uh, uh, california they they are doing very well in in smart uh, care, healthcare i think that that's one another thing that maybe can help us in in the mental health area mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think to add on to Jiang Long's point, I think the concept of personalized care, I think precision mental health, right? Precision health, I think that's where we are heading towards. Yeah. I think the ability of technology, I think that's where it lies. Mm. You can really understand who the person is, what are some of the underlying social factors, who is this person, right? Are they afraid to like uh, step up to see a counselor face to face? Do they prefer online modalities? Yeah. I think these are things which you can tell a lot better using like sentiment analysis, what this person does online. I think these are the various data sources that you can accumulate and then provide the right recommendation or intervention to the individual. I think that's the, the key lever of change with the use of technology. Thank you so much. This has been a great, great chat today. I'm sure we could have talked a few more hours longer, but um, our poll is saying no, the, we are not ready for the application of psychedelics. Slightly relieved by that. 33% undecided. No one said yes. There we go. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Janice, Dr. Berla, Anthea, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Uh, um, and Jian Long, thank you so much for, for joining us virtually today. Uh, we really appreciate your insights and thoughts. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, and thank thank you to you. our audience that joined us um, online and, and here in Singapore. And that brings us to the end of day two of our third Future of Healthcare Week in Asia. And I wanted to th uh, take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers um, uh, who have shared their valuable insights with us today. And the sessions today, uh, we explored a whole, a whole host of different issues along in the realm of preventative systems and, and non-communicable diseases. Uh, we looked at where digital diagnostics and therapeutics can drive access to healthcare and lead to decentralized health, how urgent the labor shortage is, um, and uh, how it, various how technology might, might uh, play a role in upskilling. Um, we also looked at some of the solutions in solving the global disparities in healthcare for women um, and how barriers to accessible early cancer care can be fostered in the region. And we had a great uh, conversation today on, on mental health. Um, certainly a huge, huge challenge to address, but um, plenty of ideas on, on how to go about tackling it. Big thank you today. Uh, big, big thank you to all for, for joining us. A reminder that most sessions from the past two days are available on demand for another four weeks, should you wish to catch up. A big thank you to all the supporters of the Future of Healthcare series as well, Pfizer, WhatsApp, uh, Abbott, Hong Kong Trade and the Development Council and ASGH and Philips. Thank you so much and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. <laughs>